أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم dear viewers of Imam Hussain TV and welcome back for the seventh episode in today's series the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen. In today's episode, we discuss one of the most significant battles that occurred in the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen, a battle in which Salman al-Farsi engineered something which had not been seen before by the Arabs, the ditch, the Battle of Khandik. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyid Ali, our dear guest. How are you keeping? Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullah, my dear brother. How are you? Alhamdulillah, it is a huge honor to have you here. Thank the you so honor much is for mine. taking your time. Thank you. I want to ask you, first and foremost, with regard to the Battle of Khandik, what led to its occurrence? Who were the people that came against Rasulullah at this time? Because obviously we've seen two other battles previously now, Battle of Badr, Battle of Uhud. And now we're coming to Battle of Khandik, which is one of the third, obviously, major battles. You've mentioned there are other smaller altercations. I know the Quraysh was one of the parties. Who else would be the parties that joined together? Ahsan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayibin al-tahirin. Wa la'natullahi ala adaihim ajma'in ila abadil abadin. One of the most important, significant events in the history of Islam and the Muslims was the event of the battle of Ahzab or the parties, the confederates, um, which is also named by the Khandaq, the trench or the ditch. And what led to this was that uh, after Quraysh engaging in a battle against the Muslims for two consecutive years, year second after the Hijra and the third after the Hijra and Uhud, Badr and Uhud. And each um, conceded the battle to their advantage. Still, um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was a target for them. Rasulullah and the government was still, was still growing more and more. Um, tribes and clans and groups were advancing towards the holy city of Medina. Um, although there were um, some minor side events um, that affected them, the Islamic government and the Muslims um, from here and there, from the Munafiqeen, the hypocrites, and the, um, the people of the book, the, the Jews, which we spoke about numerously in the previous episodes. This time, um, there was different interests involved in the annihilation and annihilating Islam and the Holy Prophet of Islam. Okay. From one aspect, there were the, the Jews that have, had been uh, exiled okay. from Medina. Bani Qaynuqa, Banu Nadir. Um, they had their homes and their wealth distributed between the Muslims. They couldn't sit to see um, this happening. From one side, they were the, the pagans, yeah. the pagans of, of, of uh, Quraysh, the pagans around Medina. Um, they had their um, sons, family members, join Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They had their slaves and servants turn against them. Mm -hmm. So their livelihood, according to how they saw it, was being turned upside down. Which meant that their authority and their power was being taken away from them by this new religion and by I this see. new messenger. Who was preaching peace, who was preaching justice, who was preaching rights of men, of women, of servants and maids, of how wealth should be distributed between everyone equally, wow, okay. of how um, the, the, the hierarchy within a clan or a tribe should be based on the level of taqwa and iman and belief, yes. not as a result of power and strength. And there was this fact that Quraysh was still unhappy with Rasulullah and with the Muslims um, because they didn't reach their ultimate goal 
in the Battle of Uhud. Though, so they wanted to continue their aim and their, their objective to annihilating Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So here, some of the Jews that were affected by the exile and the banishment of Rasulullah from the city of Medina, they started making moves. How? For example, there would be a group of, of those who retreated to Khaybar. They would get into a pact, an agreement, with their relatives in Khaybar to make groups of people to send to Mecca, to sit down with the Meccans, with the pagans of mm -hmm. Quraysh, and to explain to them that we have a, a, a common interest okay. in engaging in a very big battle. To this time, we put our forces and we put our, our energy and our strength together to completely once and for all, annihilate Islam from the face of this earth. So is this to say that, look, we've failed individually. Yeah. Let's, let's unite. Co let's come together. Let's come together. Fair Which enough. again, in every event, yeah. there are lessons for the Muslims to learn. 100%. 100%. As this is a test for non-believers, this at the same time is a test for the believers themselves. So they would go to the, to the pagans of Quraysh. They would sit down with... Um, Abu Sufyan and they would tell him we will support you mm -hmm. logistically we will be your ears and eyes inside Medina okay. we will give you all the information you need we will support you financially we will support you with men what we need you is to stand with us in standing against mm -hmm. Islam and the Muslims from another aspect they would go and approach the different clans and tribes of the Arabians around Mecca and Medina. Again, promising them wealth, promising them the, 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 the produce of a whole year of dates, wow. which was something the Arabians, at that time, they were going through a famine. So when you tell them, I want, for example, 2,000, 3,000 armed soldiers from your clan, and in return, I will give you the, the, the outcome of a produce of dates of a whole year, he would say, I'm going to benefit from this. 100%. This is going to mean thousands and thousands of dinars and dirhams is going to come into my hands. And I have lots of men. I have a big tribe. I can't just give them easily 2,000 to 3,000 armed soldiers. What the Arabians had in those days was armed soldiers. Yeah, yeah. So here, they this army was able to bring to, together uh, a, an army of ten thousand men. Okay. Ten thousand men. Ten thousand armed men, which was made up of different parties, different ahzab. One side is the the Jews. The other side is the hypocrites, the munafiqeen, mm -hmm. which again, they wanted to annihilate Rasulullah. Yeah. Because from once upon a time, for example, they were in control of Medina. Yeah, literally. Yep. And Rasulullah came and took that power from them. Individuals like Abdullah ibn Ubay and his uh, allies, they were in control of everything in Medina. And they had allies. They have agreements, trade agreements, financial agreements, um, safety and security ag agreements. So here, there were the, the Jews of Medina, um, the Munafiqeen, the hypocrites, and the pagans. They all came together under one banner, and their aim was to annihilate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Now, from another side, we have Rasulullah who received the news of, of the pagans and the munafiqeen and the Jews who are trying to attack Rasulullah and attack the city of Medina. He establishes a council. He wants to know the opinion of the Muslims in regards of this attack and this army which is approaching the city of Medina. Um, he says to them, shall we use the tactics we used in, in Badr where we all go out to them and fight them in the middle of the desert or we remain as we did 
in the outskirts of Medina, protecting ourselves in, as we did in Uhud. Each individual or each head of a tribe comes and gives their own opinion. One of the opinions placed forward in front of Rasulullah is the very famous opinion of the very famous companion of Rasulullah <coughs> an individual by the name of Salman who previously was known as Salman al-Farisi and then in this event he became to be known as Salman al-Muhammadi <laughs> and in this occurrence his strategy was something unique obviously which we will discuss so if you want to would you mind going into the actual strategy itself and what that strategy actually looked like for the Muslimin because obviously Coming from somewhere else, you know, not the main Arab Arabian Peninsula, yeah. his thought process, his mentality was definitely Ahsan. different. He's been through previous wars, he's seen a lot, so he comes with his experience. Ahsan. So go for it. Taking the geographical location of the city of Medina, and if we, if we were to look at the whole city of Medina from a bird's eye point of view, um, the city of Medina is located in an area which is very a mountainous region. Yes. So, um, uh, from the east and the south and the west, the city of Medina is surrounded by mountains. From, uh, from the south, from behind the south side of Medina, there is the location where Banu Nadir and, and uh, Banu Qurayza had their homes and their fortresses and their orchards, their palm trees, their gardens. So it was a very, um, an area which was congested with, with orchards and palm trees, which was very difficult for an attacking army to, come to, to enter the city of Medina from that side. I see. From the sides, as we said, there were mountains, but what was, uh, which, what was important for Rasulullah was to protect the city of Medina from the north side which was um, an area which was easily accessible. Okay. There wasn't no palm trees and there was no mountains, so it was open uh, area where an army could attack easily. Salman <coughs> al-Farisi in, in that time, being a very learned individual, being an individual who was from a very prominent Persian family, mm -hmm. um, being advisors, to um, their, their uh, leaders of, of the Persian Empire, empire a very powerful family. He was experienced, he received that knowledge yep. of, of the, the art of, of, uh, of, of battle warfare. So he came up with this very genius idea, mm -hmm. which was, Ya Rasulullah, when I was back in Persia, and when they were being attacked, one of the things they used as a strategy to defend themselves was to dig a trench around the city or where they are going to face the enemies. So Rasulullah accepted and agreed to this idea and soon after Rasulullah encouraged and ordered the Muslims to start digging a trench. The trench was according to history, roughly around three kilometers long length in length. Wow. Yeah. Um, and in width, it was around three meters and so, and in depth, it was around four and a half <coughs> meters deep. I see. Which, to some historians, as they narrate, it took six or seven days. SubhanAllah. Because Rasulullah assigned each specific area to a specific clan or tribe yeah. and told them this is your area you are responsible this is the dimensions we want you to dig and start digging okay so Rasulullah divided into two or three different segments he himself was one of the individuals to show the Muslims that I myself am there to give them strength to support them although it was the time of winter it was very cold and the, the, the Muslims, as a result, were experiencing extreme famine. Yeah. Yeah. They were being sieged by the Mushrikeen and the pagans. So food was something very scarce. Many of them had not eaten or food was very little. They were being rationed. 
Um, as an example, one of the Muslims came to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, and after you know engaging in digging the trench, he came and showed Rasulullah that Oh Rasulullah, I am I can't I don't have the energy I don't have the strength I haven't eaten, and he showed that he had put a stone. This is the practice of those days that they yeah. would tie Hajar al Maja'a, the the stone of of um, uh, of um, hunger onto their stomach to make to give the feeling that they are full okay and to tighten the area of the stomach so the stomach doesn't the abdomen doesn't start um noticing hunger rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam of course showed his stomach and said look I've, you've got one stone i have two stones wow so rasulullah was sharing that pain and that difficulty with the muslims and he did not, as some uh, so-called leaders, they order and they just go sit down and enjoy themselves and yeah, eat yeah, and, yeah. and feed themselves while their people are hungry and suffering. Salman was there, Amir al-Mu'mineen was there, the rest of the companions were there. They were all actively digging because they knew that the, the army which is going to approach is a, a big army. Then... Things happened that made the belief of the Muslims stronger in Rasulullah. This was a test for the Muslims. Because the hypocrites from one side, their weapon and their tool to weaken the Muslims was to spread rumors and start whispering um, hearsay and whispering um, wrong information about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa by saying that these promises are just empty promises there is no revelation you will be defeated uh, he is not going to be able to help you the mushrikeen and the kuffar are going to come and annihilate you and you are in winter you are cold you have no food you are weak think about your families your women and children so all of this was having a negative effect on the Muslims. At the same time, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa for example, um, as we said, it's a mountainous region. When, uh, when they are digging the trench, they will be facing some difficult rocks or stones that they, are ca they cannot break, they cannot carry. So they used to seek refuge to Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, this big rock or the, this big stone we cannot lift, we cannot break. And it's standing in the middle of the trench. So Rasulullah would come, he would take the axe or their tool and strike it amazingly. This is the miracle of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants to test the, the so-called Muslims yeah. that there is nothing difficult for Rasulullah sallallahu wa If he can crack a rock and a stone, yeah. which no one is able to do, then facing the enemies is nothing for him. Yeah. So Rasulullah would strike this rock and stone three times, shattering it into pieces. Subhanallah. And Rasulullah would say that every time I striked it, there was light or fire being um, coming out of my strike. And in every strike, Allah would give me the glad tidings that um, you would be conquering one part of the world, the Persians and the Romans and um, the rest uh, of those who stand against you, Rasulullah. So they dig, the trench is ready, yep. and the army of 10,000 armed men advances towards Medina. How many were the Muslims? Totally, mm -hmm. the inhabitants of Medina, of Muslims, were 3,000. To some narrations, including women and children. Wow. Okay. If we were to take away the women and children, maybe a 900 or a 1,000. One to ten ratio. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wa sallam is convinced, is happy with the position of Banu Nadir and the Jews and Banu Qurayza. Although Banu Nadir were expelled, but what remained of the Jews in the in, in the in the back skirts of Medina, in the um, in the south skirts of Medina, in the orchards, he was confident that the enemies would not attack because Banu Qurayza are there, they are going to defend the back uh, side of the, of the city of Medina. 
So he uh, orders that the women and the children are taken closer to the fortresses of, of, the, of the Jewish community in Medina. And they go closer, because if we say the mosque of Rasulullah is, is in the center of, Medina, yeah. of the city of Medina, then um, a few kilometers down the line would be the north side, the north entrance yeah, yeah. to the city of Medina where the trench was dug, which was, as we said, three kilometers in length. And um, Rasulullah positions uh, each group uh, headed by each by uh, a companion of, of, of Rasulullah and Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa carrying the banner as usual in all of these events, um, making sure that there are no um, passages or there are no um, routes that the enemy is able to pass through the, the trench. And according to some narrations that the whole event took um, something around two, around two weeks, but most narrations explain that it took more than that. It took four weeks wow, okay. for uh, this whole event because the trench stopped the mushrikeen yeah, yeah, yeah. from being able to Across advance over. towards the city of, Med of Medina. So obviously now we've mentioned that this trench has been dug. Was there anything put into the trench? And we've discussed a lot of Rasulullah's role so far. And we know that Amir al-Mu'min was generally his main commander for battle. What is the significance of Ahlul Mu'mineen in particular when it comes down to the fighting within this? Obviously, we know that eventually Amr bin Abdul Witr manages to cross over. Yeah. And you know, it was quite a shock and a scare for the Muslims that we thought this would protect us. So now, how does Rasulullah calm the situation at this point? And how does he bring Amir al-Mu'mineen forward for this role? Ahsan, of course, um, um, the Muslims used uh, planks of wood or branches of tree, it, they sharpened them in a manner, a way where to stop uh, the advancement of the army, which was a, a very um, tactical move by the Muslims and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But then, um, as you mentioned, the name of Amir al-Mu'mineen and his, his position and the importance of, of um, the, and the place of Amir al-Mu'mineen in this battle, and the, you named uh, one of the well-known strong um, fierce warriors of the Arabians, uh, Amr ibn Abdawid al-Amiri, which was um, known to be the equivalent of a thousand armed soldier. Yeah. That no one was able to conquer yeah. or defeat an army that Amr ibn Abdawid was part of. If I'm not mistaken, I've heard someone say that it was he was famed that he used to fight the lions as if... Ascent. He was yeah. a, he was known to be the strongest warrior of Arabs, yeah. and I I I I heard in one of the um, lectures that um, he was an individual who took part in Badr, wow. oh. and he was wounded. He did not take part in Uhud, but he took he was present in Ahzab in Khandaq. Okay. So in a way, he was part of the pagans. He wanted to seek revenge. And Abu Sufyan would benefit from the presence of such an individual yeah, yeah. because this would make his position stronger. Of Overall, he wants to annihilate yeah. Rasulullah. Sure. No one would be able to stand against Amr ibn Abdawid, who is equivalent to a thousand soldiers. Here, they come, days passed, the, the pagans, they put their uh, camp around um, the entrance to the city of Medina with their camels and horses and their animals because it's a 10,000 man army yeah. made up of different tribes and clans. They need feeding, they need protection, they need cover. So here, days passed and the, the, the pagans and the parties, uh, as much as they try to cross over, they can't. All they do is throw arrows okay. between themselves. Yeah. The pagans throw arrows to the Muslims and the Muslims reply by Throwing attacking them by arrows. But then Amr ibn Abdawud and some of his companions, for days they try to go along the route of the trench trying to find uh, a, 
a way to cross over, a passage to be able to lead them on to the other yeah. side, they find an area of the trench which was smaller in terms in terms of the width. Uh, okay. So they tried to cross over with their horses to jump over the one side to the other another, uh, other side, and they were able to do that. Amr ibn Abdawud and a number of the other strong warriors from the pagan side were able to cross over. I see. When Amr ibn Abdawud crosses over, this is where Amir al Mumini comes in. He stands in front of the army of the Muslims, on the armies, on the Muslim side, yeah. on his horseback. He says, Oh Muslims, you are the ones that claim that you are going to go to the heavens yeah. if you are to die on the battlefield. Yeah. And if you will go to heavens if, if you kill me. Yeah. So come out. Come out. Why are you afraid? Why are you scared? Where is your brave men? If you, if you are believers in Islam and what the, the, the prophet that you follow has promised you, Regardless of the conclusion of the battle, you are going to go to the heavens, yeah. which is what you want. Yeah. So come out. Amr ibn Abdawud was an individual that knew many of those individuals standing beside Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam from the olden days, yeah. from the okay. days of Jahili. Mecca, yeah. from the days of Jahiliya. So he knows exactly these guys standing on the front no side of the army. They are in our daily terminals they are chickens yeah yeah <laughs> they are very well known yeah. to run away to those flee spy, yeah those spineless men they won't fight me here. ahsan yeah. so he stood there the muslims rasulullah listening this uh, this strong warrior amr it is amr amr ibn abdawud yeah yeah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals as we said reveals a whole verse about this event, Surah Al-Ahzab, which speaks about the, the defect of the Munafiqeen and the treachery of the Yahud, and also the, the condition of those weak believers that were on the side of Rasulullah, that Allah describes their condition, that says that وَزَاغَتِ Absar, their eyes, started moving to the opposite side yeah, as, a, as a sense of fear, as a result of the, the fear that they had, that this is Amr, Batal al-Abtal. This is the one who a thousand men cannot defeat in the battlefield. وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ hanajir And their hearts, as a result of the extreme fear, their hearts was as if it was coming out, it reached their throats. Wow. And you start questioning your faith and belief and you start questioning Allah and his message and his messenger. So basically, you, your faith is just nothing. It's just whispers and words. So here, Rasulullah says to the Muslims, is there not of you a man who is able to confront this mushrik, this kafir. And the other side, Amr ibn Abdul is shouting, وَلَقَدْ بُحِحْتُ مِنَ النِّدَى فِي جَمْعِكُمْ هَلْ مِنْ مُبَارِزْ I'm losing my voice. <laughs> I'm developing a sore throat to the, to the amount of times that I am shouting. I want a, a brave warrior to come out and face me. Yeah. Rasulullah says, أَلَا مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يَخْرُجْ لِهَذَا الْكَافِرِ الْمُشْرِكِ well, and I promise him heaven and paradise. Ali ibn Abi Talib, in every occasion, he would step forward and raise his hand and said, Ana lahu ya Rasulullah. I am for him. Rasulullah would say, he knows, Rasulullah knows Ali is able, Ali is for him. But he wants to give a chance. He doesn't want to give excuse to others. Yeah. From the first instance, if Ali ibn Abi Talib comes out and nominates himself and Rasulullah accepts, yeah. others would come out later and say, wait, well, Rasulullah didn't give us a chance. Yeah, of course. They would use it as an ex excuse. Rasulullah would every time would say to him, 
testing the Muslims. He would say to him, Ya Ali, innahu Amr. Ali, this is Amr. Do you know who Amr is? Trying to mean yeah, yeah. that we don't have anyone brave enough to face Amr. The second time, Amr calling out, Alam al Mubarez, is there no brave warrior to fight me? Ali, alayhi salam, second time comes out. Wow. Rasulullah says, Ali, stay aside. Let me see the others. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran explains the condition of those around Rasulullah in that moment very beautifully. It's as if they have birds perching on top of their heads. You know when you have a bird or a pigeon on top of your head, you, stay very you want yeah. to still as still you want to stay as still as possible so that bird doesn't fly off. This is their condition. Yeah. No one made a move, fearing that as soon as they make a move, Rasulullah will think that yeah, this guy is <laughs> nominating himself. So the third time, yeah. Rasulullah shouts, Rasulullah, the messenger, why would you have ill feelings towards Rasulullah? Yeah. Why would your faith be weakened towards Rasulullah? Didn't you see how Allah supported him in Badr where he sent the angels to support the Muslims? You were there. You still have doubt? But still, what do you do? Allah wants to highlight all oh, Muslims who are going to come afterwards. Are you going to be part of the individuals that will look at all the companions of Rasulullah with the same lens? Or are you going to differentiate between the one whose iman and faith is strong and between the one that stayed still and did not observe? This is a message to everyone out there. If you want to know the position of the Sahaba or the companions, go and look at the event of Ahzab. Bring us one example of the rest of the companions, of those who you, up, you revere in your history. Bring us one reference that speaks about them killing one person on the battlefield. But then go and study the life of Amir al muminin We have some events that Ali ibn Abi Talib, for example, in the event of Badr, he killed more than half of the, the mushrikeen. He killed half and the rest of the Muslims, they killed half. <laughs> so here, the third time, Rasulullah calls out, Ala minkum man, ala minkum rajul. Yuqabil, is there any one of you who is a man, who is a man to stand in front of this enemy of Allah? It was then that Ali ibn Abi Talib came out. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ana lahu, I am the one that will face him. Ah. Rasulullah says, Ya Ali, innahu la'amr. Rasulullah knows, he wants to show, he wants to tell people, look who yeah. comes going to face this person. And Amir al muminin says, Wa ana Ali. Uh, 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 and uh, I am Ali. Yeah, Rasulullah comes, receives Ali ibn Abi Talib, hugs him. Rasulullah places his turban on the head of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Amir al muminin advances towards Amr ibn Abdawud al Amiri, stands in front of Amr. Amr says, Who are you? I don't recognize you. Tell me, who are you? What's your name? Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Ana Ali ibn Abi Talib. Amr says, you are the son of Abu Talib? Ali alayhi salam says, yes, I am. Amr says, I am not, I don't wish to kill you. Because your father was a good friend of mine. Wow. There is good tides yeah. between me and your father at the time or in the days of Mecca. So I don't wish to kill you. I don't like to kill you. Ali ibn Abi Talib, look at the brave person. Look at the one whose iman is strong. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, but I like to kill you. <laughs> because you are the enemy of yeah. Islam. You are here to fight Rasulullah. I like to kill you. Amr says, you like to kill me? Ali ibn Abi Talib says, yes. I give you three options. Amir al muminin This is the, the well-known attitude of Ahlul Bayt once they come in the battlefield. Similar to what Imam al-Hussein done on the day of Ashura when he stood in front of 
Bani Umayya on the battlefield and said to them, إِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَكُمْ دِينٍ وَكُنْتُمْ لَا تُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْمَعَادِ فَكُونُوا أَحْرَارًا فِي دُنْيَاكُمْ If you don't follow Islam as a religion and you don't believe there is a day that you will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least be free men. Amir al-Mu'mineen, his father in the battle of Ahzab, when he confronted Amr ibn Abdawud al-Amri, he said to him, I give you three options, choose one of them. And you are known, he says to Amr, he says you are known to be an individual that you will choose one of them. In every battle, if anyone was to give you options, you will, cho you will choose one of them. So Imam Ali alayhi salam says, I give you the first option, which is leave the worship of the idols and come and join Islam. Because Islam is the religion that will, see, will guide you towards success. Amr says, no, how can I do that? Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says, the second option is go back to your family. I don't want to engage in a battle with you. Be free in your life. If you don't believe in Islam, you don't believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go back to your family. I don't yeah. carry any grudge against you. Be free, go. Amr says, and you want the women of Quraysh to start laughing at me? <laughs> that I left the battlefield when yeah. I faced you, O oh Ali? No, I will never do that. And the third is that Amir al muminin says then, uh, the third option is that you engage in battle with me. And I want you to, to make the first strike. So people know that we, the family of Rasulullah, are not the ones that start the battle and the war. I mean, Imam Hussein on the battle of Ashura, he said to his companions, Akrahu an abda'ahum I do not wish to start the battle. Because we are a family that wants to establish peace in every situation. So, Amir al muminin says, you are talking to me on top of your horse and I am standing on the plains. I want you to come down from your horse. To show his bravery, Amr ibn Abdawud comes down and to show that there is no return from this battle, he takes out his sword and cuts the, the feet of his horse to show how brave he is, and he is not afraid of anything. The poor horse falls and starts struggling in front of him, in front of the Muslim, which again enters fear, fear into, into the hearts of yeah. the Muslims. It was all tactics. It's as if to say, if I'm doing this to my horse, what will I do to you? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And True the horse was something valuable in yeah, those days, especially the horse of Amr. Not any horse is able to carry Amr, because Amr was someone built yeah. very tall, so this horse must have been one of those proper um, strong horses of the Arabians. So Amir al-Mu'mineen sees what Amr done. Amr starts to strike Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu wa sallam. Amir al-Mu'mineen was wearing, was holding a shield and was wearing headgear. So Amr advances towards Amir al-Mu'mineen, raises his sword and strikes one mighty strike upon Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen takes the force of the strike with his shield. The shield is affected. The strike hits the headgear of Amir al-Mu'mineen, cracks the headgear and reaches the head of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Yeah, and Amir al-Mu'mineen starts bleeding. Then Amir al-Mu'mineen sees the strike from, of Amr with a very brave way he strikes the feet of Amr. He cuts and amputates the legs, legs. of Amr. Amr ibn Abdawud here falls onto the ground. As Amir al muminin advances towards Amr, Amr as a result of hatred and the fact that he, he has fallen to the ground, um, spits in the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa Then here Amir al muminin becomes upset and angry, as would anyone. Of course, yeah. But the Muslims then can't see what's happening because of the sand and the soil and the dust in the air. As the sand settles down, they see Amir al-Mu'mineen is rotating, walking around. He's not finishing him off. Then they see that Amir al-Mu'mineen, after walking around for a while, he goes back. All the Muslims are saying, Ali, go! finish him off 
Now they are brave. Moments earlier, they were as, as if bridges were, were on <laughs> So Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu wa sallam advances towards Amr. He sits on his chest. And Amr asks him, he says, why didn't you finish me off when I spat in your face? Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu wa sallam explains to him that if I had done so, it would be the fact that I forwarded, I placed my interest and my ego before the interest of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I do not do anything out of the interests of, of my interest and I neglect the interest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he um, severs the head of Amr and there were other enemies who had been able to um, cross pass, over. cross over. He also kills them. And he carries the head of Amr and comes towards um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah had two very important statements on the day of Khaybar. One was when Amir al muminin was going towards Amr, Rasulullah said, خرج الإيمان كله إلى الشرك كله. That's the whole of Iman is going towards, advancing towards the whole of shirk. Because on, the, on, on that day, Ali ibn Abi Talib resembled the whole of Islam. And Amr ibn Abdul was representing 10,000 armed men who were there to annihilate Islam, represented the whole of shirk. So Rasulullah announced, Baraza al-Iman kullu. The whole of Iman. And there is nothing left. The whole of Iman. Whatever Iman is, whatever Islam is, it's represented by Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then when Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi, came back to the tents, to the <coughs> camp of the Muslims and the army carrying the head of Amr, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, announce, makes an announcement. ضَرْبَةُ عَلِيٍّ يَوْمَ الْخَنْدَقِ تُعَادِلُ عِبَادَةَ الثَّقَلَيْنِ To another narration, ضربة علي يوم الخندق تعادل عبادة أمتي إلى يوم القيامة which means that Rasulullah said the strike of Ali عليه السلام on the day of خندق is equal to the عباد of ثقلين the jinn and the ins the humans and the jinn and then the second narration is it's equivalent it equals the ibadah of my ummah until the day of judgment. That's one strike of Ali. Super. Why? Because it was the strike of Ali ibn Abi Talib that saved the banner of Islam. In the battle of Uhud, we have Jibra'il announcing between the heavens and the earth, لا فتا إلا علي لا سيف إلا ذو الفقار and this is another occasion which specifies the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib which says ضربة علي يوم الخندق تعادل عبادة الثقلين which is O oh Muslims without the strike of Ali ibn Abi Talib your ibadah, your worship, your salah, your psalm, your hajj, your everything is worth nothing without the wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib without the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib and that as a conclusion was so significant that it protected the Muslims to an extent that that set the Mushrikeen, Abu Sufyan and the rest of the Mushrikeen as a result of the death of Amr ibn Abdawid on the plains of the battlefield. They never did they think that they are going to engage in a battle to annihilate the Muslims. And the Muslims, Rasulullah, it was then they knew the honesty of those who really believed in Islam from the companions it highlighted the position of the hypocrites and it also highlighted the position and the honesty and the sincerity towards the covenant between Bani Quraidah because Bani Quraidah inshallah we will come to speak we wanted to mention them but we don't have time how what Bani Quraidah did in the conclusion of the battle of, of Khandaq okay. and Ahzab, again, that, that showed the Muslims how the Ahl al-Kitab were dealing with them and their work, the logistics, how yeah. they helped and supported the Kuffar and the 
pagans and also uh, highlighted the position of the Muslims which helped them and supported them towards the, the future events which is one of them is the conquering and the conquest of Mecca. Well, I'll tell you one thing. This episode in particular just made me smile throughout. It shows the beauty of how, you know, people claim to be something, yeah. but haq will always Ahsan. prevail. So, and it teaches us a lesson. One thing in itself was the way Amir al walks away and everything. It's a very significant lesson till today of how, you know, swallowing your pride, swallowing your anger for Allah and Allah will reward you. With just the statements Rasulullah said, it shows us till today, it resonates till today in a sense. So. And again, that shows the presence, those who question the presence of Ahlul Bayt in the Holy Quran, especially, specifically Amir al muminin If you go back to the verses and the chapters revealed in regards with these events, i.e. Yes. Surah Al-Ahzab, you will find the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib in the Holy Quran. So this gives us lessons, brothers and sisters, that the whole initiative after and behind these events and these programs is that to give us bullet points for us to go back and read and increase our knowledge about Islam and as a result increase our faith and Iman and how we stand fast alongside Rasulullah and Amir al-Mu'mineen in our lives. Thank you so much Sayyid Ali, it's been an honor hosting this one with you. Jazakumullah. Take care of yourself and Thank we look you. forward to seeing you again soon. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless the uh, viewers of Imam Hussain TV. Ilahi Amin. Thank you so much our dear viewers that continue to join us week in week out for this beautiful series. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.